If you're like me, it's really hard to recall all the Valar names and what they're known for. Name me just two. Two of the Valar. Two of the Valar. Hey guys, today we have the first of two very special videos where we're going to talk about the Valar of Tolkien's works. Now, a quick refresher, the Valar are the powers of Arda who shaped and rule the world and live on the continent of Amon, otherwise known as the Undying Lands. In the past, I've used the example that Eru Iluvatar is like God with a big G, whereas the Valar are like gods with a little G. Now, because chivalry isn't dead, we're going to start with the ladies first, covering the queens of the Valar. Now there's three things I wanna establish real quick to help us keep our bearings when we're talking about timeline elements with the Valar. First off, the Song of the Ainur. This is the event when the Ainur created all of the world through their song. The Ainur included the Valar, which we'll begin talking about today, as well as the Maiar, some of whom we know as characters like Gandalf, Saruman, Sauron, and the Balrogs. This event is where, right off the bat, Melkor, also known as Morgoth, began to sow discord in the world. Second, the two lamps. These were great lamps that once stood at the northern and southern ends of Arda. These existed during the time when Melkor was in hiding, after the first war among the Valar. During this time, the Valar actually live in Middle-earth, specifically on the island of Almorin, in the middle of the symmetrical world they had created. Eventually, Melkor comes back and destroys the two lamps, which also destroys the island. Finally, the two trees. These came after the destruction of the lamps, and they give light to all of Amon, until they were destroyed by, you guessed it, Melkor. Their last flower and fruit were made into the moon and sun. Okay, now that we've established that, let's dive into the Queens of the Valar. First, we will cover the three queens that are counted among the Aratar, the High Ones of Arda, which are the greatest of the Valar. Varda Elentari, Queen of the Stars. It is said that Varda knows all the regions of Ea, the created world, or to put it simply, the universe. She rejoices in light and is said to be too beautiful for words, as within her face radiated the light of Iluvatar himself. When Melkor first began to create his discord in the Song of the Ainur, Varda saw his mind and despised him. Melkor fears and hates Varda the most out of all the Valar. In the beginning, Melkor is unable to control light, which Varda is most associated with. And when Manwe fights Melkor in the First War, Varda comes to her husband's side. During the Spring of Arda, where Middle-earth comes to life, Varda fills the two lamps with light, which in turn give light to all of Middle-earth. Varda lived with her husband Manwe in Ilmarin, their mansion on the summit of Tenequetil, the highest peak in the world. It is said that together, Manwe and Varda rule over all of Arda. With her, Manwe sees beyond all eyes through mist and darkness, and with him, she can hear all voices from every corner of the world. When Mandos, the doomsman of the Valar, foretells the coming of the elves and that they would always look to Varda in reverence, she sets new stars for the elves to see when they wake. These stars were made with the dews of Telperion, the first of the two trees. The creation of these stars is said to be the greatest labor of the Valar since the beginning of time. Because they beheld the stars first, the elves love and revere Varda the most of all the Valar. They call upon her in their hours of deepest darkness, as you see in many of Tolkien's works. They often refer to her by her Sindarin name, Elbereth Gilthoniel. Understanding the connection between Varda, the light of the two trees, the elves, and the Silmarils helps to explain much of the reverence and the events of the elves going forward. The elves love Varda for creating the stars, which they also love. These stars were made from one of the two trees, the Silmarils also contain light from the two trees. When Feanor creates the Silmarils, it is Varda that makes it so that any being or creature of evil could not handle them without being burned. After the two trees are destroyed by Melkor and Ungoliant, the ancestor of Shelob, Varda sets the course of the moon and the sun in the sky. At the end of the First Age, it's Varda who places the elf Erendil as a star in the sky. You may remember from my Elrond and Elros video that Arendil was their father, who wore a Cimmeril upon his brow as his ship sailed into the skies. 
I give you the light of Erendil, our most beloved star. Now getting into the Third Age, we see in Fellowship of the Ring that the elves Frodo, Pippin, and Sam meet in the Shire are singing a song praising Varda. Frodo also calls out to her by her name Elbereth when he's attacked on Weathertop. Aragorn refers to her name as deadly to the Nazgul. In The Return of the King, Frodo calls out to her when first using the file of Galadriel in Shelob's cave. Sam also invokes her name in a kind of prayer in Kirith Ungol after he wields the file, which I'll attempt to pronounce here. A Elbereth Gilthoniel, O Menel Palandiriel, Le Nalon Si Dingurthos, A Tironin Fanulios. This translates to O Elbereth Star Kindler, from heaven gazing afar, to thee I cry now in the shadow of the fear of death. O look towards me, ever white. The Maya Olorin, or Gandalf, is associated with Varda. He himself is associated with light and fire like Varda herself. But we'll get to more on him in a minute. Yavanna Kementari, giver of fruits. Yavanna was known as the queen of the earth. She was responsible for all growing things. Yavanna was second only to Varda in reverence. She was the wife of Aule, the smith and creator of the dwarves. Her usual form was of a tall woman robed in green. In the Song of the Ainur, Yavanna sung of the branches of the great trees that would receive the reign of Manwe and Ulmo. Her thought also met with Manwe's, causing the arrival of the great eagles. As Morgoth was corrupting her beloved creatures, she worked against him. After Melkor goes into hiding, Yavanna helps usher in the Spring of Arda, a period of peace and flourishing in Middle-earth where the lands become filled with trees and herbs, birds and beasts, and all the lands are green. When Melkor destroys the two lamps, all of Middle-earth is put into the sleep of Yavanna to protect them until light should come again. Yavanna came to Middle-earth working to heal the hurts of Melkor while the Lord Orome hunted Melkor's monsters and kept the shadows at bay to protect the inhabitants of Middle-earth. Also, after the destruction of the lamps, Yavanna's song brings forth her greatest creation, the two trees, which gave light to the land once again. It was during the sleep of Yavanna that Aule created the dwarves. Yavanna is fearful that her husband's creations will cut down all the trees of Middle-earth. Aule tells her that even men and elves will need her trees as well. Yavanna laments to Manwe, asking if anything she made would be free from the dominion of others. Manwe brings her concerns before Iluvatar in prayer. Iluvatar has pity on Yavanna and creates the Ents to protect the trees. After Melkor and Ungoliant destroy the two trees, Yavanna examines their remains and says she can heal them if she could use the light of the Silmarils, which themselves contain light from the trees. We won't get into it today, but Feanor, a jerk of an elf and creator of the Silmarils, refuses, and Melkor steals the Silmarils, and much of the events from the Silmarillion follow. But back to the remains of the two trees. Yavanna, with the help of Nienna, managed to bring forth one silver flower and one golden fruit from the trees. Yavanna gives these to her husband Aule, who fashions vessels for them, creating the moon and the sun. Centuries later, in the Third Age, when the Valar decided to send the Istari to help combat the threat of Sauron, Yavanna begs the Maya Kurumo, who was associated with her husband Aule, to take her servant Iwendil with him. And this just may be plants the seed for contempt that grows in Saruman the White for his fellow wizard, Radagast the Brown. Nienna, Lady of Mercy. On the surface, Nienna may seem like a real Debbie Downer, but she played a pivotal role in a couple key areas in the history of Arda. Nienna was the sister of the lords Mandos and Irmo. She was associated with grief and sorrow, but also with pity and courage. She is the final of the three High Ones of Arda, among the queens of the Valar. Nienna is ever mourning for the wounds of the world by evil. It is said that those who listen to her learn wisdom and endurance in grief. She lives in the halls of Nienna, located in the distant west, near the halls of Mandos. There, she dwells alone and rarely travels to the joyful city of Valmar. More often, she goes to the halls of her brother Mandos to comfort and counsel those in the halls of waiting who cry to her. Her part in the music of the Ainur was one of deep sadness, which caused grief to enter the world in the beginning. She was close to the Maya Olorin, 
who we all know as Gandalf. It is said that he learned much from her, which is easy to see with his compassion and knowing the value of pity and patience. It's a pity Bilbo didn't kill him when he had the chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed Bilbo's hand. Do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment. Nienna also played a part in the making of the Two Trees of Valinor. She wept on the mound of Ezelohar, watering it with her tears. After Melkor and Ungoliant destroy the trees, she once again weeps on their wounded remains, which cleanses the filth of Ungoliant and helps to bring forth the last fruit and flower that would become the sun and the moon. The pity of Nienna is most clearly seen when she supports Melkor when he sues for the pardon of the Valar after his first capture. Even though she spent her time in the world mourning Melkor's destruction in Arda, she spoke in support of him. Spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. Este, the gentle. Este had the power to heal all hurts and weariness. Her favorite place was an island on the tree-shadowed lake of Lorelin in the gardens of Lorien. Now this is a location in Valinor, not to be confused with the Lorien we know as the dwelling place of Galadriel later in Middle-earth history. The Lorien of Valinor was home to Este and her husband Irmo. There, they tended to the elves of Valinor who drew refreshment from the fountains. Even their fellow Valar would go there to find ease from the burdens of Arda. Varda, the queen of stars who we talked about earlier, originally intended to place the sun and the moon in the sky, one traveling from the east, one from the west, to allow for a mingling of their lights. Este and Ermo, however, spoke against this, as the excessive heat and light withered their gardens, hid the stars, and banished restful sleep from the earth. Varda listened to their counsel, and she changed the course of the moon and the sun, each taking turns traveling through the sky as the other lay in the encircling sea. Now these next few queens of the Valar we don't know as much about, so we'll get through these rather quickly. Vire the Weaver. Vire was the wife of Mandos, the doomsman of the Valar. Vire was responsible for weaving the story of the world with which the halls of Mandos are clothed. The elf queen Muriel, when she returns to life, entered into the service of Vire recording all the deeds of the house of Finwë, her husband. Vanna the Ever Young. Vanna was the younger sister of Yavanna. Like her sister, Vanna had influence with the flora and fauna of Middle-earth. It was said, all flowers spring as she passes and open if she glances upon them. All birds sing at her coming. She robed herself in flowers and her hair was golden. She had, quote, the beauty of both heaven and earth upon her face and in all her works. Vanna lived in gardens filled with golden flowers and often came to the forests of Orome, her husband. Two notable Maiar who served Vanna were Arian and Melian. Melian served both Vanna and Este before she departed for Middle-earth. There she would meet and marry the elf King Thingol of Doriath and play an important role during the first age of Middle-earth. Nessa the dancer. Nessa was known for her speed, being swift as an arrow. She could outrun the deer who followed her in the wild. She was also renowned for her dancing ability and often danced on the evergreen lawns of Valimar. She married Tolkas on the Isle of Almarin in the Year of the Lamps 3400. Vanna robed Nessa with her flowers for the wedding. Nessa was also the sister to Orme, the huntsman. So there you have it, the seven queens of the Valar. Varda, the Queen of Stars, Yavanna, the Giver of Gifts, Nienna, Lady of Mercy, Este, the Gentle, Vire, the Weaver, Vanna, the Ever Young, and Nessa, the Dancer. In my next Tolkien Explained video, we'll cover the Lords of the Valar. So be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell so you don't miss it. And when someone challenges you to name the Valar, you can put them in their place. Do you want the Valar of Water, Olmo, or do you want the Hunter Whoa. of the Valar, Orome? <laughs> or do you want the Valar of the Trees, Ivana? Or do you want the Lord of the Airs, Manwe? Or do you want his wife, Varda, called Elbreth by the All elves, right. who kindled the stars? You come into my house! Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.